channel it's uh it's friday morning probably about i guess probably about 10 o'clock and uh i thought i'd come up along the river the water is really really running fast and uh you can tell by the color of it that most of it's coming off the mountains uh, i'll turn the camera around so y'all can see this is one of my favorite places to go you know during the dry season this is all dried up but uh, we'll walk over here to the bridge and uh we'll get out there and see what's, what it looks like further upstream it's a beautiful day today it's probably about 33 34 celsius and the wind's blowing air's nice and clear he's enjoying his lunch <laughs> oh good but uh I'm gonna we're gonna get get up in the city i'm gonna walk around i think around the iron bridge and we'll see what it's like up there i'm gonna tell you a story about a case that i worked uh back in tennessee back years ago and it's really it's really a, a pitiful case uh i don't really i don't really like talking about things like this but i, I think this is one that uh deserves a a talk about this guy's Coming on his motorcycle. Hey, how you doing? But uh, it's a case of, of, that I worked uh, involving a police officer from New Jersey. And uh, it doesn't really have a very good ending. Yeah, you can see the water's pretty high. out further over here now they're doing some construction work up around uh mckean hospital i don't know exactly what they're doing whether they're putting a road along there or just building the uh the river up now there's a guy over there fishing interesting and i want to thank everybody that's coming to the channel left comments uh bought coffee super thanks uh i really appreciate that uh, this next year i'm going into what they call immune therapy and uh i'll be going in the hospital once a month to get get an injection and uh i'm gonna have a lot of out-of-pocket expense on this one this one's gonna cost me about probably anywhere from 15 to twenty thousand dollars but uh you know it's, it's just something i need to do and, and I'm, I'm gonna do it But anyway, let's jump in the car and uh, head up into the city and we'll go walk around the Iron Bridge. We'll see you in a little bit. It's a favorite lunch spot for everybody. Nice and shady. Well, here we are out just uh, a little bit north of the Night Bazaar. We'll walk down here to the uh, to the iron bridge and uh, see what's going on here a lot of people out moving around i saw an accident on the way up after i left the uh the last stop i was coming up the, the road by the river and there was a truck uh turning into a, a parking space and he had a uh, about three uh three pieces of rebar sticking out about eight feet behind the back of his truck with no marker on it and as he turned he turned in front of a motorcycle the motorcycle didn't see the rebar and and uh sure enough if it didn't get him didn't hurt the guy it hit his hit his headlight his headlight busted but uh what a mess but anyway we'll take a right here and uh i'll tell you this story um it's a true story it's a case that i worked that uh was not really very pleasant um, but you know I, being a cop that's it, you know you get all kinds of different cases some of them you enjoyed and some of them you didn't and uh, this was one that uh, tugged on my heart quite a bit with this hello with this truck did by me but uh, it was about it was probably about uh, hey there we are y'all can see I've lost a lot of weight and uh, it's not uncommon with this type of surgery that I had that uh, you'll lose about 40 pounds I've lost 20 
and uh, it hasn't really hurt my appetite. I'm, I'm eating like a horse now, which is good. Man, that building's all falling down. But anyway, it's about 8 o'clock one night, and I get a call at the house, and uh, I just, I happened to be the on-call detective that night. And uh, it was a dispatcher, and they, uh, they said, you've got a dead body uh, at a house out in this really, really exclusive subdivision that we had. Um, you know, the houses, you know, the houses built out there were like million dollar houses. Um, you know, just basically it was a, it was a subdivision that was basic mansions and uh, it was out in the country, but uh, it, by the time I left the department, the city had already annexed it so that we didn't have to go out there anymore. But anyway, I jumped in my car and got out there and uh, beautiful house. I mean, it was, it was almost finished. It was under construction. Um, you know, just absolutely beautiful. The, the landscaping had all been done. Uh, you know, the, the furniture had, had not been put in yet because, like I said, it was still being constructed. And uh, there were two or three patrol officers out there and met me at the outside and they said, Billy, he's, he's, uh, he's in the garage. And I said, okay. And uh, so I walked in the, in the garage and there was, a, there was a car that was, had been backed in. And uh, at, the, uh, at the back of the car, leaning up against the rear tire, uh, he was laying there and uh, he was sitting up, leaned up against the tire and he had spread a tarp out on the floor all around him and uh, actually had put the part of the tarp up over the car too. And uh, there was a, a snub nose 38 in his right hand. And uh, I, uh, you know, we, we did our own crime scenes. Uh, you know, we, we're not a large department, but you know, we, we I had, there were like eight of us and, and we were all basically trained to do crime scenes and, and uh, investigate homicides. And, and, you know, we didn't have anybody we could call that could come collect evidence. We did it all ourselves. And this is back probably 1994. By the time I took over the detective division, uh, you know, things had changed by then. We, we had lab techs that would come out and do the process of crime scenes so we could get, get on with our work. But anyway, I first thing I did was rubbered up my gloves and that when you have a revolver that's used in a, in a shooting, one of the things that you look for is a hammer spur imprint if you have a dead body. And what that is is when the person, right before the person shoots themselves with a with a uh, double action revolver 99 times out of 10 they'll cock the hammer back and they'll pull the trigger well when they pull the trigger and, and shoot themselves it basically stops all blood flow and you have what they what we call the hammer spur imprint on the thumb and i looked down and you know sure enough there it was and you know i see blowback in the in the barrel of the gun so you know it was obvious he shot himself so, you know, basically I had a suicide and, uh, you know, I, I hated those, I hated to work them, but, you know, you, you, it's part of the job. You did. I, I don't know how many suicides I worked. It was, I'd have to say probably two or three hundred easily, if not more than that. But, uh, and some of them would affect you a lot more than others. So you can see how yellow the river is right now from the water coming down off the, uh, off the mountains. And it's not really as high as I expected it to be. But anyway, uh, ambulance came and, and, you know, carted him off, took him up to the hospital. And uh, his wife was at the hospital. And uh, so I drove up to the hospital because I wanted to talk to her and find out, you know, as much as I, oh, well, before I left, I, uh, I checked his ID and uh, find out who he was and checked his uh, left, left pocket. 
and I find a, a badge and an ID. And it turns out he was a retired New Jersey police officer. Um, he was probably 66, 67 years old. A real frail guy, too. He wasn't real, you know, he wasn't bulky or anything like that. Uh, but anyway, I got to the hospital, and, and the wife was there, and uh, they, we got in this little room, and uh, the nurse was also in there with us. And I started talking to the lady, and it turns out he had retired about six months prior to this, and they had owned some property in New Jersey, and they had sold, after he retired, they sold the property and, uh, and, and moved down to uh, Tennessee, and were building their retirement home. It was really, like I said, it was a beautiful house. Probably, you know, at the time, I'd value it probably at about uh, 250, 300,000 in a neighborhood or in an area where, the, you know, the, the, the high expensive houses were, were 50, 60,000 dollars. So now I'd say the house is probably worth well over a million dollars. Uh, and they were building it. And uh, he was doing some of it himself and he had contracted some, some, some you know, some help. And uh, so anyway, in talking to her, she's, uh, she's, you know, just really distraught. And uh, she's probably 66, 67, maybe, you know, uh, kind of a heavy set woman with, you know, gray hair and uh, she's blaming herself. She says, I killed him. And uh, I said, you know, no, you didn't kill him. He killed himself. You know, I mean, there's, there's no, no two ways about it. She goes, no, you know, I'm the one that caused it. And we got to talking. And it turns out as they were building the house, the meter box on the house was put in the front of the house. And I went back and looked at it, sure enough it was, and she didn't want it there. Good food at Duke's. You always get a good meal there. And uh, she basically uh, refused to move into the house until the, uh, the meter box was moved to the back of the house. Now in order to do that, it was going to cost them about another $30,000 to move it. And uh, they were already $20,000 over budgeted on their, on their plans. So she had got on him so hard that, uh, you know, he, uh, he committed suicide. And that was the, the sole reason for him doing it. And uh, I mean, I just, I couldn't. You know, I, 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 I couldn't really fathom that, but, it, but that's exactly what happened. And, uh, and she was, you know, she knew that, you know, her, the way she treated him, the way she talked to him, and uh, the things that she did caused him to, uh, to kill himself. And, you know, I tried to console her as much as I could, but, you know, I'm a cop. I'm not a, you know, I'm not a psychologist or anything like that. And, uh, when I was finished, I took a statement from her, and you know, I was pretty much, uh, pretty much finished. But I told the nurse, I, I pulled the nurse outside, and uh, I told her, I said, that lady needs to talk to somebody, and she needs to talk to somebody tonight. I said, because she's going to kill herself. And the nurse looked at me, she gave me a dirty look. She goes, I know my job, I know what I'm doing. And she's fine, and you know, uh, nothing's gonna happen. Well, I, uh, you know, like I said, I'm just a cop, you know. I don't know much, but I knew one thing. I knew there were a lot of guns at the house. That they, they were actually renting a house inside the city while their uh, house was being built, so. I made arrangements to, uh, to go out to the house that night and I confiscated all the guns that were in the house. I didn't have any legal right to do it, uh, but if nobody objected, I was going to take them and put them into evidence and that's exactly what I did. I, I think I probably, 
I had to have been at least 20 guns because it filled up my trunk. And I, I spent the rest of the night logging guns into evidence. And, uh, you know, I told her, I said, you know, you can get them back, but just not right now. So, you know, there's no big deal. And about, about a week or two later, well, no, it wasn't even a week or two later. I'm sorry. It was before he was, she had him cremated. And before she had him cremated, or, or after, a day or two after, she came by my office and talked to me and uh, brought her, her daughter. She had a daughter. They had no children, but she had a daughter from a previous marriage. And, and the previous, the daughter was the only living kinship that she had. And uh, she introduced me to the daughter and she told me that, uh, you know, they had a, had a cremation service and she uh, gave me a little bit more information about where he worked and stuff. And, uh, and then she left. And I, uh, I called the department and I talked to one of the detectives up there. I told him what had happened. And he basically told me that uh, while, he, while he worked there, she, uh, she, was, she was horrible to him. If he, you know, if his friends came over and they wanted to play cards and drink, they had to go downstairs in the basement and shut the door. She wouldn't let them you know, in the upstairs of the house. There's one of the oldest Christian churches in Chiang Mai right there, beautiful place, uh, really nice. And uh, the detective told me, she goes, you know, it, it doesn't surprise me, she was horrible. And uh, she treated him bad. Uh, he kind of lived like a second class citizen and uh, you know, it really made me feel bad. Uh, you know, here's this guy who worked all his career and got into retirement, and, you know, and this happens. And so, you know, I just, I basically told him what happened and I said, no, you know, I'm awful sorry and, you know, kind of hung up on him. Didn't hang up on him, but I, I ended the conversation. So, it was about two weeks later, I'm, uh, I'm sitting in my office and knock on the door and uh, open up the door and it's one of the city detectives. Because they, they, the house that they rented was inside the city, it wasn't in the county. And uh, he had a letter for me. And he said, uh, he said, I just worked a suicide over in such and such subdivision. And uh, he said, the lady had left the note for you. And I looked down at the, at the note, sure enough, it was her. She had, uh, she had waited, till her, waited till she had buried him, or cremated him, had the service, and her daughter had got into town. And what she did, she pulled the car into the garage and closed the door and uh, committed suicide by, you know, uh, carbon monoxide poisoning and it was it was horrible you know I, I just I just felt like throwing up and uh, I wanted to take that note to that back to that nurse and stick it in her face but I didn't do it it's probably a good thing I did I don't know what's happening now oh okay we started back up again what's happening the battery's getting hot and it's shutting the the camera down but anyway when she had left me a note she had put some furniture into a shop to have it re, uh, re, re, re upholstered and the guy was giving him a hard time and uh, basically the, the letter asked me to uh, to help her uh, her daughter get the get the property back and uh, you know a few I'm sorry's and you know all that but uh, I just, you know, I kind of felt sick to my stomach. I went ahead and, and called the guy and, you know, explained the situation. He did go ahead and give him the property back. And about three days later, the, uh, the daughter came by and, and uh, you know, she was basically the, you know, the only heir. So everything, else, everything that they had went to her, including the, you know, the big house that they built. 
And so I gave her back all the weapons and the guns and stuff, and, and that was basically the end of it. Um, and you know, just it just left a sick, sick feeling in my mouth. But, you know, sometimes that's all you can do. But uh, you know, when you get into a situation like that, when you're into a do dominant relationship, it's best just to get out. Um, if you're not happy, chances are you never will be happy. Now they got a roadblock set up right here. And I'm gonna stand here in the shade so maybe I can finish this video without the camera shutting down. Yeah, they're nailing them. Coming around the corner with no helmet. No excuse for it. If you're out here, you need to be wearing a helmet. But anyway, I appreciate everybody coming in and watching the video. And uh, I'm going to head back to the car, try to go find something to eat, and uh, we'll go from there. Anyway, hope you enjoyed it. Leave me some comments, and uh, we'll see you on the next one. Bye-bye.